Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's first Saturday webinar for 2022. This is also the first in our five-episode Spring of 22 series on the progressives. Today's episode was titled, What is a Progressive? We were joined, as usual, by Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University, Dr. Jason Jividen, the editor of Teaching American History's new Populists and Progressives Core Documents collection, and Dr. David Alvis. Well, Happy New Year to everybody, and welcome to another TeachingAmericanHistory.org Saturday webinar sponsored by the Ashburg Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I teach political science uh, here at Ashland University. I'm also director of the uh, Ashburg Scholar Program for undergraduates here. Um, this academic year for our webinar series, Saturday webinar series, we're drawing inspiration from um, two core documents collections that Ashbrook has published. Both are available at TAH.org. In the fall, our theme was the presidency in context, drawing from our American presidency core documents collection. This spring semester, we're discussing populists and progressives drawing from a very fine collection edited by Jason Jividen, who was one of our panelists for today. Uh, you can access all of the documents in these collections for free online at tah.org or purchase them in paperback format. In case you're joining us for the first time, uh, the point of these webinars is to bring together some thoughtful scholars and have a lively conversation about important questions. And we encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the Q&A function. And as always, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. In the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today our topic is, what is a progressive? And to help us think about this question, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. David Alvis of Wofford College and Dr. Jason Jividen of St. Vincent College. And as I mentioned, he is also editor of our Populists and Progressives collection. These are two very thoughtful scholars known them a long time. They've both written about, researched, and taught uh, on this topic quite a bit. Uh, I actually had the pleasure and honor once of teaching the course on the progressives with David many years ago, and I learned a great deal from him then. So I'm looking forward to learning from these two uh, fine scholars this morning. Thank you both for joining us. And thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Chris. So uh, normally I put just a minimal amount of thought into coming up with an opening question, but our topic today <laughs> is actually a question. So why don't we start with the question, what is a progressive? How, how do we start thinking about this? Anybody want to start us off? That was the laziest I, you know, introductory question ever. Yeah, I'll just say something really quickly just to get the ball rolling. I, you know, in, in working on this, this volume of documents, you know, there's a short introduction and that's a question I had to think about. You know, how would you sort of begin to, to answer that question? What is a progressive? And, and I'll start with an obstacle. And, and the obstacle is that it's often hard to determine exactly what progressivism, you know, as an ideology or as an ism really is, because it's got such a disparate array of, of sort of contributing um, factors and traditions. You've got sort of, uh, you know, uh, late 19th, early 20th century populism. You've got German trained PhDs. You've got suffragettes. You've got temperance reformers. You've got um, all sorts of um, varying sects of Christian reformism. And I had to really think hard about that question. And one thing I came up with, and this is just the beginning of an answer, but the, the fact that progress is in progressivism, one thing that might bind all those things together in some ways is a dedication to the notion that the human being and the human condition is progressing over time. The history itself might be progressive, uh, that what comes in one age replaces what came in another age and is, is an improvement in the human condition. But maybe more importantly, that it's history that's driving that process. And that sometimes we can have an insight into that process and through social science or social engineering or through education, we might help to speed that process along perhaps, but we're sort of riding the wave of history. And so it's really history with a capital H or progress with a capital P. So I think a dedication to that in some ways defines what a progressive is despite all of the differences among them. Um, when I teach it to undergraduates here at St. Vincent off and start uh, with a slower pitch, which is to say that progressivism is a movement around the turn of the century up until around the 1920s was an academic movement, but it was also um, a political movement. And one thing that united those two things was the idea that we're gonna give, um, because of changing circumstances, especially in the economy, we want to give the people more direct control over their government, more direct control over legislation, more direct control over their constitution. 
but at the same time then to give all levels of government more power over the economy and more power over the private sphere. And I think that's something we still understand today when we talk about progressivism is sort of a loose term, but that's just the beginning of an answer. I don't know, David, if you want to add to that or subtract for that or correct that, but that's sort of how I began in talking to students about it. Yeah, I mean, the difficulty, <clears throat> I think, in, in teaching progressivism and understanding it is that the, one of the problems with progressivism is that really it's an intellectual movement that masquerades as a political movement. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> while there were, while the intellectuals were trying to draw certain political conclusions um, that they they differed very much on what the political conclusions of uh, uh, a political or the public policy that ought to follow from progressivism was. Um, and so therefore, if you try to say, well, it's a coherent movement based on its political agenda, there is no coherent political agenda. And um, one of the, also to another difficulty with understanding progressivism is that if you try to understand it from the various policies or, or positions that were being advocated at the political level, um, there actually are you know, two, def, uh, two different definitions of progress going on during this, during this period. Um, you know, there's, there's two different ways you can define the notion of progress. One is the Jeffersonian notion of progress. And that is, is that social change, especially uh, a movement towards greater social equality is uh, a necessary uh, development from the first principles of the declaration. And that notion of progress is embraced um, particularly uh, in the civil rights movement, right? Uh, particularly among, uh, uh, in the advocacy of political equality for African-Americans. Um, during this period, and that notion of progress, that same notion of progress is at the heart of the suffrage movement. But that's not the same thing as the other definition of progress, right? And the other definition of progress is not looking to the past uh, to understand where we should be going in the future, but rather rejecting the past because it's an obstacle to pursuing the future. And that notion of progressivism is very different. Um, it involves primarily uh, a critique of American political institutions and the principles on which they stand, right? Those enlightenment principles um, and looking for in some ways a substitute, right? In the future for those, for those principles uh, and new institutions of government uh, that will make that possible. So, you know, it's it, again, it's really hard to derive, right? A coherent movement from the various political positions uh, but you can see a, uh, the coherence from its intellectual positions. Uh, those um, who call themselves progressives during this period, meaning that you know we're looking to replace the American political tradition with new principles, uh, generally agreed that change was the most important thing. Uh, there could be different position, policy positions, but what, what was key is uh, that we need a radical transformation of the American political order to move forward. Yeah, just quickly, I'll just I'll just add one thing in terms of this this reader that we put together. There's a uh, some of you that use these readers know there's a thematic table of contents in the back of each edition, and so one of those themes is the the political theory of progressivism. It very much speaks to the the things that David mentions here. Um, in fact, that's probably for me the real key the key theme in the volume because what the volume does is in some ways it speaks to this question to say that. Uh, teachers are especially interested sometimes in social policy and reform. Some people teach progressivism merely by talking about constitutional amendments. And what's so important is that progressivism was first and foremost an intellectual academic movement. And so we often, history, history professors especially, will talk about progressivism in a period. Well, it's from the 1880, late 1880s to 1920 or something like that. But progressivism as an intellectual movement is very much alive and well. Um, it's been alive and well, especially on college campuses and in textbooks um, ever since the turn of the, of the century. And so progressivism as an intellectual movement is, is every bit as vibrant as, as it ever was. Yeah, those are two very thoughtful introductions to the topic. So just if I can just add one thing there to what you were saying, Jason, what I like about the collection and even the selection of readings that you recommended, you guys recommended for today is you, you get a good sense of, uh, um, of where the intellectuals are coming from, the intellectuals who call themselves progressives, but you get a wide range of emphases, right? So some of them are focusing on changes to, you know, our under, our very understanding, the American understanding of what liberty is, um, 
uh, and others work in sort of the political considerations and 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 these sorts of things. So, so it is hard to come to sort of I guess um, come up with a very simple, clean cut definition of who a progressive is. Can can you guys talk a little bit more about where these ideas came from? When did this idea of this different idea of progress emerge? David, you were making the distinction between sort of the Jeffersonian and the progressive understanding. When did when did these new ideas start to emerge and and where did these ideas come from? Because it seems to me ideas don't just pop up out of nowhere, right? There's often a, a paper trail, so to speak, um, leading up to these things. David, yeah. you get started? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of it, right, um, part of it is an intellectual movement that begins in uh, Germany, um, ge you know, generically referred to as historicism. Uh, and the argument is, uh, to, to put it in very simple terms, is, you know, we used to think, right, that uh, the principles of politics derive from certain fundamental axioms, right? They're always true, right? They derive from nature. So take, for instance, the social contract, right? Human beings are by nature created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. Uh, in, in order to form a government, you have to have the, the those people have to give up their natural equality um, and consent uh, to a certain form of government. So, you know, that's a good axiomatic statement of uh, philosophical principles defining uh, your political life. And historicism argued that uh, there aren't these universal principles, right? Or rather, these ideas emerge uh, slowly over history um, uh, through the evolution of, of certain uh, principles and tensions, right, within history. So that human beings are, there's no fixed truths about human beings, rather, human beings uh, evolve as a product of their circumstance. And um, that, that's, in, in America, uh, I mean, one of, actually Charles Merriam mentions one of the major uh, sources of that uh, uh, from a, there was a professor at the, uh, back then it was not called University of uh, South Carolina, USC, it was called uh, Columbia University. Uh, there was a professor there named Francis Lieber uh, who was quite influential. Actually, Lieber wrote the uh, uh, codes, right, um, uh, for the for holding military prisoners during the Civil War, and that became the basis of the Geneva Accords. Um, so the uh, uh, you have people like Francis Lieber. You also too have the development of PhD programs like at Johns Hopkins, where a lot of these uh, German intellectuals uh, uh, who were proponents of, of historicism, right, um, came to influence the country. But in America, really, there, the, the way this gets formulated in a more popular way that people understand um, is, uh, one is uh, uh, by the emphasis on Darwin as a sort of new paradigm for thinking about politics. You know, we used to think of politics, as uh, Woodrow Wilson says, right, in Newtonian ways. You know, there's fixed truths about human nature. Now we have Darwin, right, who teaches us right, that everything is a matter of slow evolving change. And so the, the Darwin kind of becomes, right, the understandable model for this historicism, right? Things don't, aren't, there's no fixed truths, right? Things evolve over time. And the other major influence, right, is Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, Turner's Closing of the Western Frontier thesis. Here you have another historical thesis that seems to explain the changes taking place uh, in the, uh, uh, and uh, towards the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Um, you know, we used to believe, right, that, you know, human beings uh, were self-governing and had individual freedom. And that was possible to believe that back when, you know, you could always move away from any oppressive circumstance and move out to the Western frontier. But now that that frontier is gone, right, and people live in, you know, crowded urban cities and don't really have any option of getting out, Right, we need a. Uh, there needs to be a new philosophical paradigm for our for our generation. So it's really Turner and Darwin that become kind of the way that people begin to understand this uh, this German historicism in America. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add just a little bit. That's fantastic. In fact, I don't have a lot to add. I'll just say this: that that a few things just to underscore the influence of the emergence of German trained PhDs in the social sciences can't be overstated. Um, there really were no PhDs in the social sciences prior to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is a good example. 
trained by people like John Burgess, right? Um, one of TR's, uh, one of TR's professors in the Miriam piece, Burgess has cited liberally. Uh, Burgess is all over the piece on this emerging historicism. Um, there are some nooks and crannies here, though, about sort of the turn to history and away from some idea of social contract or natural rights, or the idea that there are immutable truths that are that are true everywhere and always. And, and I think progressives sometimes play around with these different strains. It's never entirely clear how to tease them out. One is certainly German historicism, which in some ways the appeal to Darwin is just a popular way of talking. They're not talking about Darwin. They're often talking about Hegel. And they use Darwinian terms because they're hot and they're hip and they're accessible. We say evolution or development or organic. That famous Wilsonian line about Newtonian versus Darwinian constitutions, if you really push on that very hard, it falls apart. The metaphor is a little bit brisk and a little bit breezy, um, and I think really what he's talking there is uh, talking about there is historicism. But the other sort of strand of this turn to history you get is something a little less radical. It's it's the the English historical school. Think of someone like Edmund Burke with this suspicion of natural rights because it leads to things like the French Revolution. And so it's not to deny the truth of these things; it's to question in some ways their political applicability and the prudence of how you talk about them and when you talk about them. And Wilson is a good example of this. Sometimes when he talks about history, he talks about this English historical school. But I think where that really comes out in the American experience, notice Miriam um, twice references the influence of Calhoun on progressivism. And this is something when I, I study this with my students, it blows their minds. How could we possibly see John C. Calhoun as one of the progenitors of progressivism? And the reason Miriam does it is because Calhoun turned to the idea of history in some ways is a better explanation for liberty and a better understanding of liberty and the purposes of government than appeals to nature. And so if you read Calhoun carefully, you do see that he's very skeptical of the idea of, of natural rights, very skeptical of the idea of the social contract or the state of nature. In fact, he says that Jefferson was simply wrong when he declared that all men were created equal. And he says liberty is, is a product of organic development that actually isn't enjoyed equally by all peoples. Different peoples deserve liberty at different times. And that's why in the Miriam piece and elsewhere in progressivism, you see that idea applied to things like progressive foreign policy, colonization, the Philippines, et cetera. It's all a consequence of the turn away from nature and, and towards history. So that's just, just adding and underscoring a couple of things that David had said. This is really good stuff. We've got a few questions coming in. I don't know if you guys can see the questions or not. Um, they're in their Q and A. If you want to, if you see one and you want to jump on it, please feel free. But, and I want to turn to those questions in a second, but Jason, you brought up, Calhoun, and of course, Calhoun was, um, when he rejected uh, the, the sort of the natural rights, if you will, or social compact approach to thinking about, about politics and government, he was often doing that in the context of explaining the relations between the white and, and black races. Um, and that reminds me that um, progressives had a lot to say about race, did they not? And, and you mentioned you know, like the colonization, I know, and justifying a lot of foreign policy actions, you get, you've got a lot of language. And Miriam is very clear on this, right? Yeah. Uh, the idea that there are, there are sort of uh, you know, superior races, the Teutonic races, and there are, there are inferior races. But there, there's a difference, right? Isn't there a difference between Calhoun's way of thinking about race and the progressive way of thinking about race, or is there no difference? Well, I think there are differences, and it depends. This kind of speaks to our first question. The progressives, in my estimation, are all over the map uh, on the question of race. And so, and sometimes when you see a progressive defense of, let's say, um, greater practical equality between the races in terms of political rights or, or social rights, or whatever it happens to be, or economic opportunity, one wonders on what grounds progressives can argue for that equality absent some appeal to natural rights. There might be a sense in which they're, they're arguing for policy proposals that might not actually follow from their first principles, from their theoretical arguments. But in terms of race, I think the progressives are all over the place. On the one hand, you have someone like Jane Addams or obviously W.E.B. Du Bois, but then on the other hand, you have um, a kind of ambivalence about race among some, I would argue, probably Wilson, um, and, the, and maybe even another hand, there should never be more than two hands, but if you even have a third hand here, I think you would get into the idea of um, aggressive colonizing foreign policy and the rise of people like Albert Beveridge or even Teddy Roosevelt, who has a famous essay called The Expansion of the White Races, which Chris, I think maybe you've assigned in class before, that takes yeah. this Teutonic lineage argument to suggest that different races are on different paths of development. Not that races can't develop in terms of their capacity for political liberty, but they're not all on the same path. And so because of that, um, out of uh, duty to those other races, they need to be ruled paternalistically. 
And that is not so different than what Calhoun argues in his positive good argument. Um, it's that slavery in the time being in this stage of history is better for the slave than liberty would be. Um, Stephen Douglas even comes close to making the same sort of argument in Lincoln Douglas debates to say, I don't know whether Africans have natural rights. All I know is they're not yet ready to exercise them if they have them. And so I don't know that it's so different in some instances, but this is a great example of where it would be hard to talk about the progressives as monolithic on the question of race. It's very fashionable these days to beat up on the progressives for this question, Wilson being the most famous example. If you go to Princeton, names or statues are taken down, buildings are being renamed um, because of Wilson's um, indifference to integrating the federal bureaucracy uh, when he was president and leaving things up to his, his staff. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of difficult and really intellectually dishonest to group the progressives all together under run, one umbrella on this question. All right, David, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I also too, I, just to add one thing um, or sort of reiterate a point, <coughs> uh, Jason, that you made, and that is um, they have a particular notion of what, what they mean by race, right? Um, so the, you know, uh, it, you, you read these really disturbing lines in Miriam, right? Um, I'll just give you one. Uh, he says, An another is that the Teutonic race should never surrender the balance of power to others. Um, so, and, you know, um, and he says, right, they must have a colonial po policy, barbaric races, if incapable, may be swept away. And such action violates no rights of these populations, which are not petty and trifling in comparison with the transcendent right and duty to establish political and legal order everywhere. I mean, so there's these really disturbing lines uh, uh, about it. And it's important though, to see what, they're, what they understand by the notion of race. So they're talking about, from their point of view, the uh, society right, d develops historically. And so there are uh, civilizations that have achieved, a, uh, that you have a higher civilizations and lower civilizations that have de been developed over time. And so the goal of society, right, is always to move towards the higher level of civilization. And from their point of view, right, um, like for instance, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and others who argue for expansionism, it's the duty of the higher civilizations to help the lower civilizations move up to a, a higher level of existence. Uh, so imperialism is not a sort of wielding, uh, simply a wielding of power, right? It's also a humanitarian action. And what's important about that for progressivism is, is that progressivism is really challenging this notion that all human beings are equal. Uh, their argument is that's just not true, right? Because there is no abstract human nature that you, of, of which you could describe it as being always equal. Rather, people develop over time through historical evolution. And what they're, the big case that they're making here in this racial argument is they're making the argument that you need the rule of the wise, right, uh, over the less, uh, those who are uh, less intelligent, right, about affairs of government. Um, so, and we need some sort of way of justifying that the wise or what they would refer to as experts really ought to have a duty to rule over other people. And the biggest obstacle to progressivism is this American belief that human beings are equal and that government is founded on consent. Because that implies that everybody understands the fundamental purpose of government and everyone uh, uh, can, uh, has an intelligent uh, uh, understanding of what government ought to look like. And from the progressive point of view, that's simply not true. So there was one question raised in the chat, right? How, do, how is progressivism uh, from the 19th and 20th century similar to progressivism today? And, and from, in, in many ways, right, the emphasis of progressivism today is that you need government by elites. You need experts who really know these things. And the problem is, is that the general population doesn't understand certain scientific issues or economic issues that are necessary to make good judgments about public policy. And we need some justification for why the experts should rule, even right um, without uh, a knowledgeable population consenting to it. Right. I just add a couple things very quickly, Chris, to that. I think that that last question um, is a great question and could take up our entire <laughs> our entire morning. I think thinking about this question of comparing progressivisms. Um, I think one strand that does remain true is this this 
emphasis on rule by the educated elite, by administrative technocrats, et cetera. Listen to the science is a progressive phrase. Um, that's not a new phrase. We've, we've heard that phrase in other iterations, and there's some respects in which that might be desirable. In other respects, maybe it isn't. But um, I do think the content of the, uh, what those experts, what they're ruling over, and the ideas they're appealing to might change a bit. So much of what's going on at the turn of the century in progressivism are economic issues. It's economic circumstances that have changed that require us to think differently about rights and the ends and means of government and limited government. Um, I think the, the, the rise of identity politics and our political rhetoric in the last 20 years or so has changed in some ways, often the content of what we're speaking about, that's a little different than what you see in some, some earlier progressive writings. But one thing that David said made me think a bit about this idea of the ends of government. Um, in the Miriam piece, uh, he cites Burgess in talking about the end of the state or the end of government being the perfection of humanity. And that precisely speaks to David's point about race and about imperialism. It also shows up in this, this book that I know David knows a lot about far more than I do, this book, The Promise of American Life by Herbert Crowley, um, which we've read an excerpt from. But in the broader context of reading that book, you'll see that Crowley says that democracy itself has to stand or fall on the platform of human perfectibility. That the, at the end of the day, what we're after here is perfecting the human condition, perfecting human nature. And to the extent that you think you can do that through scientific expertise or through the march of history in some ways defines the, the flavor of progressivism that you're advocating. And what's so great about Kroll is he says, this could all be wishful thinking. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's impossible, but if, if, it's, if we don't try, what are we doing? What are we doing here? That's loosely paraphrased, but yeah. And, and it's interesting for the progressives, they don't regard that as anti-democratic in, right. in their understanding. Their view is, is that, look, we're trying to promote the very best democracy for everyone. The problem is, is that your average citizen doesn't know what's best. So therefore, right, you need elites in order to achieve the ends of democracy. In other words, right, the, if the goal is uh, democratic, you know, they, they tend to use vague phrases, democratic fulfillment, right? The, the means of achieving that cannot be through democracy. It's That's gotta right. be through the rule of experts. One thing that comes across in some of the readings today, but also other readings in the volume, it speaks directly to this point David's making, is the, the, the real necessity of influencing public opinion. Um, at the end of the Miriam piece, but especially um, a couple times in the Goodnow piece, there's an argument, look, educate, let's, 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 let's all be honest, says Goodnow. All of us educated experts, social scientists, we understand that this natural rights, state of nature, social contract mumbo jumbo isn't true. Nobody in their right mind really believes these things anymore right. among educated people. But then he says, it's difficult to tell. In fact, I think that the general population still believes it. And so remember that Goodnell piece is a lecture to teachers, future teachers. And he says, your job is to go out and change opinions. Yeah. Miriam says, your job Good is point. to go out and change opinions. If you read Woodrow Wilson's pieces like Leaders of Men or the Study of Administration, on opinion leadership. The purpose of, especially we would argue eventually presidents, is to go out and change opinions about the ends and means of government. And this speaks precisely to David's point that one thing that might define progressivism is a pretty full-throated argument that um, progress requires a redefinition or an overcoming or a reevaluation of founding principles. So many of these pieces just end with a very frank admission that we're trying to change hearts and minds. This is really this is really good stuff. So it's, um, so there's a uh, this is another way in which I think progressives disagree, right? I mean, you get a lot of talk about I, maybe from almost all of them. They're they're calling for either a new kind of democracy or a repurification of democracy of some sort. But it seems to me they're they have different understandings of what democracy is in terms of the relationship between those who who rule or lead and those who who are governed, right? So Dan asks in the questions, doesn't rule by experts conflict with the progressive promotion of more democracy? For example, you know, the calls for recall initiative referendum, 17th amendment. Can you guys talk a little bit about, you know, those calls for more democracy and how you square that with calls for more government by enlightened leadership? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fundamental tension in progressivism. It's such a fundamental tension. It's an essay question I like to ask sometimes of various students to try to think through this so that I can better understand it. Um, but I'll, I'll say this, and this is the beginning of an answer, and I'm sure David can, can certainly speak to this as well. Um, one thing that's pretty famous, it comes up in the Goodnow piece, uh, or, and it comes up in Marion. Goodnow wrote an entire book on it. It comes up in several of Wilson's pieces, like the study of administration, is the progressive distinction between politics on the one hand and administration on the other. 
And politics for some of these thinkers is the setting of, of goals, of ends, of, of policy. Um, it's the big ideas, it's speech making, it's winning elections, et cetera. Administration, on the other hand, is the down in the dirt, nitty gritty details of actually um, running policy and frankly, fixing problems. I mean, that's the end of the, that's sort of the, what's there for it the, the, as the prime goal of administration is to fix problems. And so I think a lot of this emphasis on things like initiative and referendum and recall, those in some ways are merely political in the sense that they are giving the people a kind of role and helping to um, guide and set uh, policy aims. But the actual business of governance, the actual business of really administering state, local, and federal government is going to be given to unelected um, scientific technocrats. And so the real business of the day is going to be done by people who are not subject to that political process. So in some ways, um, it's by making that rigid distinction that they can try to walk this tightrope of embracing more direct democracy on the one hand and scientific sort of unelected expertise on the other. The other thing is, and here's where Wilson, if you read Wilson in any sustained fashion, things like his famous textbook, The State, um, you'll see this Hegelian way of thinking that says, even in that political realm, that what will eventually happen is you'll have something like Rousseau's general will. What will eventually happen is we are all going to wind up agreeing on what the big ends of government are. Then that's, that's the day when we sort of reach the end of our political history. Then we can get down to the business of fixing problems. And I think that that's not just mere rhetoric. That's, that's a real sort of um, intellectual jump, and it, it illustrates your kind of faith in that historical progress. And I think you see that even in, in later rhetoric, especially in folks like FDR and the Commonwealth Club Address. But the big questions will have been answered. And that's hard for us to wrap our heads around because we don't feel like we've answered all those big questions. But that's, that's where I think many progressives, that's the, the, the perspective they're operating from. Yeah, it's, it's hard to add anything to that because I mean, it really does, uh, Jason's remarks really nicely capture this tension, right, within progressivism between, on the one hand, increased direct democracy, and in some ways, they're, the progressives are more comfortable with majoritarianism, right, than the, than the framers were. On the other hand, right, they want this rule of experts. And you know, just to reiterate Jason's point, uh, is that they do envision some way that those two things can be compatible. Somehow, the majority would articulate a sort of generic policy vision, and then the technocrats, right, the experts, would be sort of merely faithful servants of democracy and be find a way to articulate that and to uh, uh, formulate that into sound. Uh, public policy. So they're they're kind of hoping to reconcile the two. And in some ways, right, that I uh, just, uh, again, to reiterate um, uh, Jason's point, that is the most serious tension within progressivism. But it's not just an interesting historical observation. It's, it's us today. This is one of our biggest problems, is that we want an increased voice of public opinion in policymaking, uh, at the same time as employing experts to carry that out. And most of the tensions today in public policy are between those two, two aspects. So the real legacy of progressivism is the current tensions within the American uh, political order between those two elements. I, I think that's spot on. I'll just add one thing to sort of the question earlier about comparing early progressivism and today's progressivism. One, one wrinkle that we could throw in here too is you know, that friendliness to majoritarianism and progressivism, one way that expresses itself is in the progressive ambivalence and even hostility to the courts, because yeah. the courts at that time making substantive due process arguments, et cetera, are seen as the enemies of progress because they're hanging on to some of these older, they would argue, natural rights ideas. We could debate that, but um, think the Lochner era court. And so early progressives see part of the obstacle to that good governance is actually the courts, whereas today's progressivism after 1938 the way progressivism has unfolded, the court is actually seen as being a great ally of progressive change. Think about the way we talk about monumental Supreme Court decisions. All the big decisions that students love to talk about are usually seen as pressing the envelope of, of social change. And so I think once progressivism found a way to capture the court, well, then the court just is now, that's why we're always fighting over 5-4, right? It's the court has become even maybe as much as the administrative state, sort of the engine of, of, of pushing for policy change. I was just about to ask, uh, that was very thoughtful from both of you. I was just about to ask a, a, a related, maybe it's the same question, this idea of um, 
uh, this idea of, uh, you know, uh, enlightened leadership, um, governing by enlightened leadership, it's, it, it, it's potentially in tension with the Constitution. Is it, or is it? I mean, you frequently see in the language of progressives um, an attempt to, from, by some anyway, to say, well, the Constitution itself is not the problem. It's, it's this mode of interpreting the Constitution that, you know, old fashioned justices on the courts have or people in, in politics have. Never, you know, it reminds me too, the other problem is it, it, the, the Constitution is being interpreted in a certain way, um, either because people are, are still adhering to these, these ideas of natural rights and social contract, which we now know are scientifically false, or because they're sort of in the pockets of big business, right? For whatever reason, um, the Constitution is sort of being spun <laughs> in a certain way, right? To protect special interests and to prevent progress from being made. So, so can you talk? Can you guys talk a little bit about the relationship of progressive thinkers with the, with the Constitution itself? Sure, David. You want to start on that one? Well, one of the things to just observe in the um, progressive uh, platform from 1912, right, is a proposal to for an amendment to the uh, amendment clause of the Constitution. Um, so this was a popular idea at the time. It was called the Gateway Amendment. Um, and the idea was to lower the bar on uh, amending the Constitution, right? The problem was amending the Constitution was too difficult, right? Required, you know, these complicated uh, procedures and sort of super majorities. And the proposal was to amend it uh, close to the way, right, where, whereby a majority could easily, you know, uh, could easily alter it in the same way that any statutory law is either passed or repealed. Um, and so, I mean, the, the very idea of the Constitution, right, is to be a, a, a sort of break on majoritarianism. And so for the progressives, right, the, that's, that's the problem, right, is, is the uh, limitations, right, that the Constitution, Constitution imposes. And so in some ways, right, that's also too part of their way of thinking, too, about uh, the role of administration, and that is um, uh, uh, administration and in, 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 in the rule of law in general. So their their criticism of the Constitution, right, that is too slow, that is ineffectual, turns out to be the same criticism of just trying to govern generally by the rule of law. And that is the the problem in society today, right, especially um, post in, uh, with the Industrial Revolution is that the changes taking place uh, in, at the economic level and at the social level are just too fast paced for the, to be, for the rule of law to be kept up with. It's just impossible to define every potential violation of a, say, a antitrust law, right? Or something like that, it's impossible. And so what you need is you need to replace the rule of law with uh, an ability to govern through more, dis, you could call it discretionary uh, rules or procedures. And discretionary rules and procedures created by experts who really know this, these things, right? Economic issues and social issues. And so part of the, you know, when, whenever you look at the progressive critique of the constitution, really it's a critique of the whole notion of the rule of law. You know, the rule of law is an antiquated way of governing. Today, what we need, right, are uh, experts who can make discretionary judgments in case, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So today, I mean, that legacy is really very much with us today. A lot of law, a lot of what you would call lawmaking are really just um, uh, administrative tribunals or administrative judges making case decisions in particular cases. And that's, that would be a precise model of what the progressives thought would be a, a better way of governing. Than, than the rule of law. Yeah, but yeah the beauty of the beauty of those administrative courts is, by the way, they they essentially work for the agencies, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you got. Yeah. I just read some articles on uh, the, the, their win rate is like ninety percent or ninety five percent in favor of uh, the rules. It's really impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just, no, that's Sorry, exactly Chris. where I wanted to go, Chris. Okay. That's that last point. And a couple other things I'll just mention, but that last point is very very important, and it helps us understand what Wilson is after in the piece that we read um, with the whole notion of a Darwinian constitution. Remember the context there. The context of that is really a criticism of separation of powers and checks and balances, that those things frustrate um, the ability to pivot and the ability to respond quickly to situations. He says it's like checking the organs of the body off against one another. The organism can't live. 
And so the idea there is it's often hard to tease out, well, what does that mean practically? What does it mean to say that a, a constitution has to be Darwinian in structure and in practice? I think first, it's exactly what you said, Chris, it's a matter of interpretation. Um, Crowley sometimes will talk about the problem of excessive legalism, right? Of, of caring too much about reading the constitution strictly. And so Wilson wants to say a lot of progressive change and progressive policy reform can be done just through a more flexible reading of the Constitution if the Constitution doesn't prevent that. He says the problem with the Constitution was the founders and generations after tended to read it in a way that's stricter than the, they built better than they knew. The Constitution's actually much more flexible in terms of interpretation than even its, its writers understood. But the other thing that comes out of this, I think, um, is the whole notion of once you start talking about breaking down separation of powers and checks and balances, the window by which you do that is going to be often administrative agencies, because what they do is they combine and condense legislative, executive, and judicial power into the same spot. This helps us understand Wilson on administration. You've got Congress passing laws that even though they're the size of the New York phone book, they are radically underspecified, then delegating to um, administrative agencies they've created, um, really fleshing out the details of that, which is essentially lawmaking. You've got them uh, investigating and prosecuting infractions of the very laws that they make. And then if someone appeals through their own court working for that agency, they then decide the case and adjudicate. And so the very sort of construction of the idea of the federal administrative agency since the progressive era is an illustration of exactly what Wilson has in mind of a living Darwinian constitution. And it's, as David said, and, and I'll say it in a, in a, in a less sophisticated way, because he's far more articulate than I am, it's an end run in some ways around the idea of constitutional limitations. And one thing that Wilson famously argued at one point in this piece of study of administration, which is in the collection, he says, some people are really afraid of this, of concentrated power. And he says, but concentrated power shouldn't give you any pause as long as it's used responsibly. And he says, the way that you make sure that power is used responsibly is you put it in the same place, because then you know who to blame. And I'm just not sure that that's true when we talk about administration, <laughs> because ask your next door neighbor if they can tell you who's, you know, working for the Federal Trade Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission or the EPA. I, I don't think Wilson's argument quite holds up under, under current circumstances. Yeah, and never mind how they, if you do know who they are and they're not doing what, they, they, <laughs> yeah. what they're expected how, what do you to do, do, you, do how, how do you get them out of it? They're not elected, right? right? So you have to go through, through this complicated process, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, of removing them somehow, but it's not political. Sorry, David, were you going to jump in? I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I was going to just get, offer an example, right, that kind of helps to understand, right, how they, how they viewed, right, the, this new substitute for the rule of law. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is a really great example of this, right, how they, how they think this through. So, you know, you have the Sherman antitrust law from 1890, right? Now, I mean, there is a legitimate criticism of the, of the Sherman antitrust law, and that is almost every economic activity would violate the Sherman antitrust law. Um, so, but the Sherman antitrust law tried to define, right, what would constitute, right, uh, a unfair trade practice. And right with greater specificity, with with uh, prosecuting very specific violations of the of 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 uh, anti uh, antitrust law. The problem with that is is that sometimes a un what might be labeled an unfair trade practice could be economically beneficial, right? And the question is, do you want to prosecute that, right? And the idea was is that if you could create if you could create a federal trade commission. Of uh, political experts removed, right? I, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, economic experts removed from politics. Then what they could do was instead of having to follow a particular law defining what constitutes a fair trade practice, what you do is is that you just judge on a case by case basis, and if the activity right uh, is uh, harmful, then you you then then you you find that company right. Uh, or you punish that company. And if the activity turns out to be beneficial, then you don't, right? And that way, right, you don't have to operate by the generic uh, qualities of the rule of law. You can just uh, decide expertly on a case-by-case -case basis, which, I mean, in some ways, right, sounds promising. Here's one of the big problems, though, just in terms of its effectiveness. And that is, 
if you're going to if you're going to deal with corporations that way, you can't throw somebody in jail for something you let another company do, right? So the only thing that you can do is find them, right? But the problem is, is that a lot of companies saw that as a wonderful opportunity. You treat the fine like a basically like a licensing fee and just continue the process, right? And then it'll benefit your corporation. And so one of the problems that they ended up with is that the Federal Trade Commission's decisions often ended up being very ineffective because companies did exactly that. And you know, people started saying, you gotta throw them in jail. That's the only way you can deal with this. But without the rule of law, it's hard to do that. Yeah, that's a great point. And did, wasn't that part of the distinction between the approaches that say Taft and Theodore Roosevelt took to the enforcement of the- Yeah, Taft said right. you, actually, you actually have yeah, to have laws, right? Yeah, you have to follow the law. <laughs> this is a great point, by the way, just on Taft. Um, you know, we often, textbooks often will sort of pitch Taft as the arts conservative against the sort of, you know, forward thinking TR of progressive by 1912. But um, as, as Taft says in his acceptance letter for the 1912 campaign for the election, look, a lot of these laws that progressives love are passed by Republican administration and forced in my administration. And so he's a kind of, um, some people refer to him as a constitutionalist progressive in the sense that it's all well and good to pursue um, laws and policy reform, uh, child labor laws, workday regulations, mine and safety legislation, all of those things, workers' compensation, unemployment but do it through established political constitutional channels and the, the regular political process rather than um, balking at the rule of law. And probably the most famous example of this is Taft just his head explodes over the whole notion of the popular recall of judicial decisions through referenda, um, which of course TR and many of the progressives, progressives supported. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I meant to mention this earlier too. I mean, um, when we started asking, you know, who was a progressive or what is a progressive, uh, everybody wanted to be thought of as a progressive at the time, including Taft. And I think Taft, if I remember correctly in that acceptance speech, he, he, he talks about the, the progress a lot, right, that had been made, uh, you know, under his administration, but also in the years leading up to it, right? But it's, it's progress, but under rule of law or with rule of law. I think that's a great distinction, Jason. I, hadn't yeah, I, I think it speaks to David's distinction earlier between different notions of thinking really about what progress is. Is it better understanding the principles of the American founding and expanding and applying them, or is it overcoming them? And I think Taft sort of falls into that, that um, former category. Yeah. Now, this is great stuff. We have a number of good questions. If you don't mind, I'm going to turn to some questions. So this is from Mark who writes, uh, thinking about Madison and the, the tyrannical majority concerns, right? So Madison's argument about majority faction. The, the, some of the things we've talked about uh, as far as uh, progressivism, you know, both government by elites and even demo direct democracy. Um, how are those, are those at tension with Madison's concerns? I, I would say they are, but I think it's, it points to a very serious theoretical disagreement between progressives and say Madison or Madisonian political theory, political science. As a lot of folks that are probably listening here understand, I mean, for the, for the framers, at least for the authors of the Federalists, the political problem for popular regimes had always been faction, right? Um, especially majority faction in the sense that it would either tyrannize over the rights of others or over the common good. And if you think about Madison's whole notion of checks and balances, representation, um, federalism, all the things that limit and balance uh, and structure government so that it's healthy but also protective of liberty. All of those things are premised on the idea that faction, the threat of faction never goes away because it's just rooted in human nature. Um, that we are imperfect creatures and that we are prone towards self-interest and we sometimes act either through malice or through just want of information in a way that can be harmful to others or to the common good. So the only way to overcome that would be to change human nature and for Madison and the gang, that's an impossibility, right? So what you have to do is, is bear with it and try to, to control its effects. And that's why you structure the regime in the way that you do. Flash forward to many progressives, the best person I can think of as an example of this is TR in this piece, The Right of the People to Rule, which is in the reader, says Madison and later Tocqueville, folks were worried about majority tyranny or majority faction. He says, whether that was ever a threat, I don't know. But what I do know is it's not a threat today in 1912. The tyranny that I see when I look around the world is not the tyranny of the many over the few, which he says motivated Madison. It's the tyranny of the few over the many, wealthy special interests, et cetera. Men, working men, women, and children are enslaved to um, concentrated capital. Right? And he says, so as insofar as that's the case, 
that means our political science can be different. And I think this is a really honest and very um, important point that, that TR is making. If you no longer think that faction, majority faction, is the number one problem you're dealing with, then the means of government are going to look very different than what they look like for Madison. Your greatest fear will no longer be majority tyranny. If you believe that human nature is not enduring and imperfect and transcends time that way in its imperfect state, if you think that human nature could be improved through social science or through the progress of history or through breeding or whatever it happens to be, then a lot of those breaks and restraints and cautions that were placed on majority rule are no longer there and you can take the breaks off. It's also true when we talk about expertise. If you used to think that concentrating power in one spot was dangerous because of the failings of human nature, then you're going to care about separation of powers and checks and balances. If you think that human nature can be improved to such a degree that you don't need to worry about that anymore, then you concentrate power in agencies to have uh, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, the judicial in the same hands, which Madison said was the very definition of tyranny. So there's a, a real disagreement here um, in terms of first principles, I think. If we just make sure they all, all the, these enlightened leaders have, have political science or social science degrees, we should be okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah David, <laughs> sorry, you, you, you and ahead, myself David. and David, we'll just, we'll just take it yeah. over. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, David. I'm well, sorry. Well, and also, too, it's, it's right. So it's, and it's not just the, the leaders, right? But also, too, right, as uh, and Jason pointed this out a minute ago, it's their, the, the understanding about majorities, right, uh, that the progressives have. So, you know, one of, in, in, in Wilson, uh, Wilson, you know, makes this case, right, for popular executive leadership. And he says, you know, look, I understood, I understand that the, that the founders were concerned about majority tyranny. He said, but the problem with them is, is that they were too skeptical about human nature. Um, you know, probably back in the late 1700s, you know, majorities were bad because people were ill-informed. But remember, society is Darwinian, it evolves. So majorities are actually much less dangerous today than they were, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, precisely because people have evolved. They've become more intelligent. Um, they've become more, um, you could say, conservative in a certain way that is reluctant to um, uh, engage in radical changes, say, in the same way they were, say, during the French Revolution. And this is precisely because society, uh, people have evolved. Therefore, majorities are are less dangerous. And so uh, majoritarianism, right, is simply not the threat uh, that it used to be. And so the, uh, and so in, in some ways, right, there, the, part of their, their conception of direct democracy is, is that, yes, it's a rejection of Madisonianism, but that's because we don't have the kind of people that Madison uh, knew and was familiar with, right, at, at his time. Very quickly, I'll add one thing for anyone that's interested. A great place where this topic just comes up expressly is in the exchanges, the heated exchanges between TR and Taft in 1912. And so in response to that claim about not being any more afraid of majority tyranny, Taft is really pretty interesting. Taft draws a distinction between temporary majorities or what he calls shifting majorities and long-term stable majorities, which is a Madisonian distinction, right? The difference between what the people might want in terms of public opinion at you know 11:53 on a Saturday, as opposed to the long-term sober deliberate will of the people that's expressed through long-term majoritarianism, and TR is having none of it. He says, I, "I don't buy the distinction either. We're talking about the people rule; the people don't." And so you have this very interesting back and forth where they sound a lot like two political scientists going at it, and it's at the highest level of American political rhetoric. It's pretty interesting. Oh, you're muted there, Chris. Sorry, and I was just going to point out the obvious, but it ties back to something you guys were talking about earlier. Um, when when Theodore Roosevelt makes this distinction between, you know, the new tyranny of the new the new minority, he also is making those distinctions in terms of wealth, right? I mean, these are economic distinctions. So, you guys have already you know said a lot of thoughtful things about that, but I think that's also a distinction between the, the way Madison was thinking about majorities and minorities, right? Um, so we've got a number of great questions. This is all really good stuff. Um, some some of these. Uh, well, let, let me let me ask. The, let me let me mention. So Brian asks about this, the, the the scholarly debate uh, linking populists and progressives, and I wanted to mention that I think that's actually the topic of our next webinar. Uh, but while I've got you guys here, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say a few things if you want to about uh, 
the connection of populism and progressivism. And it sort of ties into what I think kind of what we've been talking about for the last few minutes. Um, and then the other thing, and then, sorry, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, please. I was going to say, David, you want to start us out on that one? Uh, I mean, I have, in one sense, right, the populist movement probably did clear some of the way for these proposals for direct democracy. Uh, but at the end of the day, I actually think the progressives are pretty hostile to people like William Jennings Bryan and others in the populist movement, uh, precisely because of their skepticism about government. Um, that's, uh, I think, the, the big difference. Um, for the progressives, right, expert rule is the key, right, to democracy's development in the future. And so, I, I you know, Herbert Crowley, I think, is probably uh, one of the... Um, most articulate on this issue. And that is, right, he points out that a lot of these populist reforms really won't achieve the ends that the populists want. And in some ways, to him, they really embody the problem of democracy, trying to achieve democratic ends through democratic means. Um, you can't do that. And so this is the basis, right, also too of Crowley's really interesting sort of history of America uh, in that selection that we have. So, you know, the argument is, it's a fascinating argument. The argument is that, you know, uh, America starts out, right, Hamiltonian with the Constitution. The Constitution was designed to put the brakes on a sort of populist movement uh, and institute a rule of the elites. And then that got hijacked by Jeffersonianism and the sort of extreme populism and sort of narrow individualism. And so really what America is suffering from is this, is this Jeffersonian populist influence, which makes you highly skeptical about government, uh, a major advocate of limited government, and the sort of extreme optimism that everyone, right, um, has sufficient knowledge to understand the ends and purpose, uh, the, the not only the ends of government, but also to the means by which it ought to be achieved. And so, right, his argument is, is that what we need are Hamiltonian means towards Jeffersonian ends. And so that's, I, and that's a real rejection of the populist um, uh, position, right? The progressivism, right, really emphasizes a strong central government run by uh, kind of like Hamiltonian elites. It's brilliant. There's there's no way I can talk that, David. That was perfect. I think you stole everything I would have even thought about saying. Um, I'll, just, I'll just add a, a couple of things. I, I think it is true that um, in terms of some policy proposals, if you go back and look at the populist party platforms, these are things that many progressives could get behind. And so uh, when we made this reader, one reason we did one on populism and progressivism is because for a lot of the teachers, their content standards ask them and require them to talk about both of these movements in relation to one another. So we want to think a bit about that. I think the volume um, starts to get us thinking about that. But I think in terms of policy proposals, things like more elements of direct democracy, things like um, uh, minimum wage laws, things like uh, workday regulations, uh, various forms of labor legislation, I think many of the or populists were already arguing for. Um, of course, regulating monopoly and maybe even for them nationalizing the lobby, which is pretty interesting, but think about the, all the arguments about the railroads and banking at the time. Those are things that the progressives could understand, but I think David hits the nail on the head to say that there really is something different about, about progressivism and elite leadership that stands in, in tension with populism, and I think the appeal to Crowley is spot on. David and I have actually written on Crowley a little bit together in the past, and that Hamiltonian-Jeffersonian dichotomy runs throughout the promise of American life, this famous book, it's fascinating. It's repeated as a truism in many textbooks by many professors, but I, I don't always know how well it, it holds up. Um, it's the beginning of a way of thinking about American history, but I, I wonder sometimes if it doesn't overstate the, the real, um, it, it overstates the differences between Hamilton and Jefferson in the early republic and understates some of the things they had in common. Among them was um, a dedication to the notion of natural rights and the rule of law. And so there's a sense in which Hamilton and Jefferson, despite their differences, might have more in common than Crowley has with either of them, um, with his rejection of some of these principles of the founding. Yeah, that's that's very that's very good, very thoughtful. Um, a couple of more questions, uh, if you don't mind. There's some, a couple of good ones. Uh, uh, two topics we haven't touched on. Um, Jessica asks, uh, was there any significant religious influence on progressivism? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I I, I saw that. I saw Jessica's qu question. That's and it's a really good one about the role of religion, right? So there was a, a, a major religious influence, right, in the progressive movement, right, known as the social go gospel movement. Um, and, um, you know, was, there was a number of uh, predominant thinkers, right, uh, but uh, it's, uh, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, it's Ro Walter Rochenbusch, right, who's yep. the yep. kind of primary um, spokesman for this position. Um, if you want to see, uh, uh, well, Actually, it no longer resembles its social gospel roots, but the YMCA, right, was a product of the, the social gospel movement, right? Um, you know, because it, it, uh, it, it used to have this strong religious purpose. Um, you know, today it's more of a kind of bourgeois workout, you know, uh, place in your local <laughs> town. But it, if you go to the like, Black Mountains, right, you'll see these old, I mean, the old aspects of the YMCA, it had this, you know, very strong religious. But what um, the essence of it was a sort of secularized Christianity, right? Finding heaven on earth, right? And also to uh, justice, right? And so the big emphasis, right, is predominantly social justice. And one wonders, right, why the movement, right, devoted to kind of science and expertise, right, had a religious element to it. And I think there's an interesting story behind this, and that is when you believe, right, there are certain fundamental fixed axiomatic truths, right? Uh, human beings are endowed with certain unalienable rights. They're created equal, right? There's something inspiring about that, right? It's a common ground that we all believe in, right? And it's these transcendent principles that guide our lives. If you try to replace that with Darwinian change and pragmatism, it's, it's hard to inspire people, right? <laughs> to, to take, be deeply committed to political life. And I think that the, the use of religion, uh, if you look at all these progressive writers, they'll be talking about pragmatism and science and expertise. And then suddenly at the end of their article, they'll end with this religious metaphor, right? <laughs> we need to be like, you know, uh, the, um, you know, they'll, they'll appeal to um, uh, uh, the, the, the Archangel Michael or, you know, something, you know, something inspiring right at the end. And you wonder why, why are you doing that? In some ways, right, pragmatism and Darwinian change are boring, right, um, and uninspiring. And you need a kind of reli religious, you know, basis to inspire. And in some ways, it, it points a little bit to the defect of the progressivism. It can't articulate a ground of political life that people can really um, bind together and believe in. And so it often has to resort to a kind of religious truisms uh, in order to, to inspire. Can I just say on that point, uh, I, it's a really good point. It reminds me uh, earlier, let's see, um, uh, Jessica had asked, when did progressivism make the shift from being an intellectual to a movement to a more mainstream movement? And I just wanted to interject here. I, it seems to me that the, the, the social gospel movement, insofar as it was trying to apply progressive ideas through a religious context to society had a big role in making progressive ideas more more popular without necessarily people knowing that they were progressive in an intellectual sense so that was an awkward yeah. way of saying that this religious thing the religious connection uh with progressivism i think had a big hand in making these ideas more popular yeah. so. uh, absolutely it, it's 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 hard to talk about history with a capital h for some audiences um, but if you talk about it in terms of providence, that's something folks can get behind. Uh, if you read Rauschenbusch, he talks about the historical process as really just being the working out of God's will here on earth. And so you're taking Hegelian analyses, Hegelian language, philosophic terms, and using them in the same way Hegel would in some ways um, in, a, in a, a religious format. A, a couple of things occurred to me just to, to sort of underscore a couple of things David said. One thing is that Rauschenbusch is great in talking about how Christianity needs to think about itself not as a personal religion, that Jividen has a personal relationship with Christ or a personal relationship with God, but an intensely social religion that requires duties here on earth. And so manifesting the kingdom of God, not in heaven, but here on earth is part of what Christian duty requires. So it's necessarily, for lack of a better term, activist or positive, right? And he says that's what a lot of Christians in America have failed to understand. And he says what this is is not a, a development of religion. It's actually a return to the original Christianity. It says this is the this will be the habits of the early church. And so 
Uh, Jane Adams makes the same arguments, by the way. Adams is another person who sometimes we don't always associate her with the social gospel movement, but she's very much part of that, that crowd. Um, the other thing that I just, a couple of examples to, to sort of um, piggyback off of David's point about ending the speech with a great line. I mean, think no further than Teddy Roosevelt's famous confession of faith speech, his acceptance speech at the Progressive National Convention in 1912. We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. All right, I always ask my students, my undergraduates, imagine if Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton would have said that at the end of a speech, right? Um, it's part of the language of the day. Another great example of this is, um, you had mentioned this earlier, I think, Chris, I can't remember if we were uh, on camera yet or not, but Dewey's famous, my pedagogic creed, right, ends with uh, the last line is this idea of us being soldiers for Christ as teachers. It's pretty, pretty interesting rhetoric of the day. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to end this, if you want to move people to go out and affect change and reform, you can, you know, say, hey, here's what Hegel says, in which case people <laughs> immediately fall asleep. Or you, you, you know, you appeal to maybe the most important uh, uh, thing in, in the lives of a lot of people, which is their religion, right? So that's a, that's a great, it's a great rhetorical point. But I, um, yeah, the, the Dewey line, is, if I'm not mistaken, is to the, the, the role of teachers is to usher in the true kingdom of God on earth, right? If yeah, I remember that's correctly. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, it can be inspiring in that sense. Um, I mean, there's an interesting parallel, right, in the 21st century, and that is, is that, you know, Obama was the first to kind of turn back to the language and, and yeah. use the term progressivism, right? Right. And you remember at the beginning of his, uh, of his first run for the presidency, right, his... Um, his argument was, we, we need to get away from this sort of uh, high-toned ideological warfare between the two sides and turn towards pragmatism, right? We're, we're going to do what works, right? Not, not based on some uh, sort of siloed in ideological view. And so the advocacy was for pragmatism. But the problem is, is that pragmatism's not particularly inspiring. It's just kind of like a sort of careful scientific plotting through of, you know, what works, what doesn't work. But you remember, it was also combined with a kind of religious rhetoric, right? A sort of millennialist rhetoric, right? We are the generation we have been waiting for. And so, you know, you, I mean, in, in some ways, right, this has always kind of been the problem with, you know, pragmatism as a basis for politics. It's, it, it may be the most commonsensical approach to politics, but it's also very uninspiring. So you have to kind of combine it, right, with a sort of high tone religiosity in order to get people to abide, to follow what might be just in some ways commonsensical judgments, right? Yeah, great point. Um, it's great points, uh, many great points here. So much to think about. We only have a few minutes left. So uh, one other thing that we've sort of touched on tangentially but not directly talked about is the progressive understanding of federalism uh, Michelle wrote, I thought the progressives looked toward reform from the state governments as opposed to sort of centralization or, or the national government. Is this another way in which we find progressives are a little bit all over the map? They don't necessarily agree on this either, do they? Or do uh, they? I, I would argue that, that it, it would, they're not mutually exclusive <laughs> in the sense that I think the uh, progressives understood okay. that the states could be laboratories for progressive reform. Um, part of what often However, though required for many progressives, more centralized legislation was when the ball didn't bounce their way at the state level, often because of state courts. And so I think the idea was you start with the lowest hanging fruit first. And so where are you going to get more likely to have a less constitutionally problematic and embrace of initiative referendum and recall? It's going to be at the state and local level. And so they certainly didn't object to a lot of these things. And, and, and think... Um, Wisconsin, right? Fighting Bob, right? The, the idea of it being sort of a laboratory for progressivism. Um, I think progressives were certainly fine with that, but that didn't mean that was to the exclusion of national level solutions uh, to a lot of these same problems. Herbert Crowley is the best example of this in his discussion of that Hamiltonian wing of the American tradition. So I don't think state action and, and federal action are at odds with one another. Um, I do think though, and I think the spirit of the question is right though, because many progressives wanted to give a more full-throated, vigorous use of national power to creating what they saw as natural problems, often through things like the Commerce Clause. Um, so I, I don't know that it means because they supported state level um, reforms and legislation that that meant that somehow they wouldn't use the, the power of the general government to the nth degree uh, to secure their ends. But I think they're willing to have a left hand and right hand going at the same time, ultimately with the right hand probably being in the driver's seat. 
David, what do you, what do you think? Uh, no, it's hard to add anything. That that's a really good point. And I just to emphasize one thing though that you mentioned, and that is you, that that phrase states as laboratories were formed. You tend to think of that as rather innocuous suggestion, right? You know, states can try different things, right? What's the what? I mean that. That's not a radical transformation. That's that is how the progressives, I think, hope that people would receive that the yeah. concept. But it is actually a radical change because what it does is it conceives of state governments as a sort of miniature federal government, and therefore, right, the, you know, it would serve as models for future reforms of the of the federal government. But the American notion of federalism is is that state governments are doing something different than the federal government. And, uh, and, and are you know, two wholly separate spheres. Today, we tend to think of the states as, in the way that the progressives in, influence that understanding. And that is kind of miniature versions of the federal government and you know, as sort of models of what you know, the federal government could become. So it did have a profound effect on, on the way that we conceive of and understand the federalism in the, in the US. Just add one quick thing, and this is totally off the top of my head, but something David said sort of inspired this. I mean, on the other hand, you can think about it this way, too, that if you think back to some of the, the say, the Federalist Papers, you know, they suggest that, well, one reason we have, you know, one reason that we talk about enumerated powers at the level of the general government is because it's assumed that in the state governments, they have sovereignty over all things unless you specify otherwise. And the general government will be limited to enumerated powers only. But if you think about it, what progressivism is doing is taking that old notion of state sovereignty as being rather unlimited unless you specify expressly against that power and picking it up and applying that to the general government um, through this very pregnant understanding of, of sovereignty. That's a great point. That's a fantastic point. So we have uh, two minutes left, so I hesitate to do this, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise Candy's question. Candy always throws these great questions out here. So her question is: If progressivism requires this sort of constant redefinition of things during you know generation after generation, and the new administrations come in, uh, how how do we ever know if it's successful? <laughs> and she has it doesn't it get lost in politics? So I think maybe what she's asking is, or maybe I'm just rephrasing it here is, I mean, has the progressive project, if you want to call it that, been successful? And, and if so, how do we know? That's such an easy question I know to throw out. <laughs> so, well, I'm just going to say what occurs to me right off the top of my head, because I don't know that I have an answer. I think it's a fantastic question because I don't know that I have the answer to it. Um, but for those of us that teach in the MAG program that teach this progressive course, which all of the, all three of us do, uh, many of us often will, at the, the last session or so, will look at sort of variants of modern liberalism in the forms of the New Deal or the Great Society. Um, as sort of maybe current iterations or reformulations of progressivism. One of the interesting things is in uh, the Great Society speech at the University of Michigan and in FDR's Commonwealth Club address, they both suggest that democracy, or in Johnson's terms, the Great Society, is a kind of never-ending quest. It's not a safe harbor. It's not a resting place. It's a never-ending seeking after better things. I'm combining addresses. But that is, in many ways, a, a, a contemporary iteration of this question, I think, that we're asking which is how do you, if, if progressivism is always on the move, how do you know when you've achieved whatever it is you're trying to achieve? A lot of progressives, including Wilson, Crowley, Dewey, many others will phrase it this way, that what we're looking for is an equalization of conditions for individual self-development. I didn't make that phrase up. It's all over progressive. Good Lord. <laughs> when we have conditions whereby all of us can be the best David or the best Chris or the best Jason they can be, unhampered by um, economic concerns, economic vulnerability, other things, that's when we will have achieved what TR calls true democracy. I don't know what that looks like. And that's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just, I don't know what that looks like. That's a, at a real level of abstraction. All right, David, what do you think? Well, and I, I think, I think the progressives did not, did not know what that looks like. So whenever they tried to describe the ends, right, they would always resort to religious platitudes. And there's a specific reason for that. And that is that pragmatism, right, which is kind of their philosophy, requires that you, the, uh, uh, the premise of pragmatism is we don't know what the end is. That's why we experiment. So then the question becomes, well, then where are you going? And the answer is, well, we don't know, but you have to posit something. So you kind of posit a religious platitude in the end. And so therefore, right, the goal is always something like human perfectibility, but we can't define what human is, right? Yeah. 
And so that's um, that ends up being your your biggest problem is is that you gotta you you've got to ask people to follow a project without any clear sense of what the end is, right? And this is in some ways the profound influence of progressivism, but it's also to its greatest defect. At the end of the day, you don't know what the end or the purpose is, but you know that we all ought to be pursuing it. That, that's fantastic. And uh, again, we're out of time, but uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for your time and your thoughts. This has been very enlightening. I hope others have uh, have, have uh, taken some good things away, some good thoughts away from this, and just really appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, guys. And thanks to the participants who submitted questions. The questions were fantastic. Just a quick reminder about the email you'll receive with your link for a certificate of participation. If you've enjoyed our conversation today, our webinar today, look into the other resources that Ashbrook provides uh, through tah.org. Uh, we have a, other webinar series that you can that you can look at. Um, also, please um, share um, you know the things that we do uh, on social media. Uh, share the archive link. Uh, you know, spread the word about what we're doing, and we're always happy to see new faces at these things. Our next web webinar, sorry, will be Saturday, February fifth and we'll be discussing populist progressives and political economy. So I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, take care, and thanks for joining. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.